On today's show, Reed Shepard wins multiple executive polls conducted by ESPN, but what are his chances to win Rookie of the Year this upcoming season? Plus, we check in on the Houston Rockets at the Olympics. Dylan Brooks, Jock Landale, Jack McVay, and assistant coach Royale Ivy. It's all coming up on today's Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe. That is the absolute best way that you can help our show out is to comment anything below the YouTube video. Just do a drive by and say, go Rockets. It helps us out a ton. Now, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more this summer because FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That means there's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And as always, thank you so much for making Lockdown Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for being an everydayer going to focus on Reed Shepard here for a chunk of today's episode as he won not one but two categories of the executive poll conducted by ESPN where uh, ESPN's Jonathan Gavoni and Jeremy Wu polled 20 different NBA executives and scouts kind of trying to get their predictions and opinions on this newest incoming draft class of uh, of NBA rookies and Reed Shepard absolutely crushed it he, he comes away uh, kind of far and away the favorite of the bunch so far now that could be some recency bias, maybe a little bit from his outstanding summer league play, but it also tracks with a lot of the pre-draft analysis and breakdowns of of who Reed is as a player. I mean, he was the analytics darling. He was, you know, uh, number one on Kevin Pelton's draft board. Like a lot of the the draft analysts, draft gurus out there were really high on Reed Shepard and deservedly so. I mean, look at how he played and, and look at how he projects to translate to the NBA level. So let's get into the couple categories for Reed and then kind of piggybacking off of these topics, uh, the, this executive poll, we'll also get into his chances at winning Rookie of the Year this next season, kind of what has to go right for Reed in order to be in the conversation. And then we'll do a quick Rockets Olympics check-in uh, with our guys Dylan Brooks, Jock Landale, uh, newly signed Jack McVeigh, so a couple of boomers for the Rockets, and then uh, assistant coach Royale Ivy uh, coaching for uh, Sudan. So let's let's start with the Reed stuff. So let's get to the first question on this ESPN executive poll. So again, a, a random polling of 20 different NBA executives, scouts, all that stuff. The first question that Reed uh, absolutely swept uh, like swept the votes in is uh, which rookie will prove to be the draft's best pick? Reed Shepard, far and away the favorite here in this category, winning seven votes. So of the 20 available votes, I apologize, of the 19 available votes, because one voter preferred not to answer for whatever reason, uh, I guess abstaining is a possibility in this category, uh, Reed Shepard won seven of the 19 available votes, coming in second place with Donovan Klingon with three votes. Then, uh, so Portland Trailblazers, St- uh, Donovan Klingon. Then uh, Stefan Castle for the Spurs got two votes. Dalton Connect with the Lakers got two votes. Bob Carrington got two votes with the Wizards. And then Nikola Topic and Rob Dillingham both got one vote each, one vote each and Zachary Reese one vote. So the... Breakdown goes on to say, on the heels of a breakout showing at Summer League, Shepard, the Rockets pick at number three, took home the most votes with best pick, loosely defined as the strongest intersection of value and fit. There's a good deal of optimism around the league surrounding Shepard's future, and the prevailing thought is that he might be the next Kentucky Wildcats guard to fully blossom upon his arrival to the NBA. And then this is a quote from a anonymous executive. Shepard is going to help Houston right away, and I think he has a chance to be an all-star down the road, one high-ranking Eastern Conference executive said. So I, I think this is important for a couple different reasons. One, it kind of validates 
the work that the Rockets did internally where they said, no, like Reed was far and away our, our number one pick on our draft board. We had him above everybody else by a wide margin. And then that tracks with the eye test and kind of what we learned about him at Summer League. And yes, it's Summer League. You take it with a grain of salt. You try not to overreact to it. But the proof is in the pudding. Like there were so many things that you saw on display at Summer League from Reed that give you confidence and should give you hope and optimism that he is going to translate and that he is going to have a very, very successful NBA career. And when you've got legitimate executives and scouts who are also kind of seeing uh, seeing the same thing that we are as, you know, as fans of the team, as fans of the Rockets, it, it's, you know, a, a big confidence boost because it feels like, oh man, th this is really is the right pick. The Rockets made the right decision. And ultimately, for Reed, I think he's going to be in a really fantastic situation here in Houston because we saw it during summer league, right? When, when teams were able to kind of hone in on him a little bit more, uh, Detroit, Minnesota, and they were able to, you know, direct all their defensive energy towards slowing down one guy. It, it did look a little rough at times, right? And I do think that Reed stepping into a situation where he's going to be a, in a winning situation in Houston, and B, he's going to be in a situation where there are going to be other guys around him that are going to be taking a lot of the heat off of him uh, from opposing defenses. That's going to even open up his game even further, right? If Reed went to, like, if the Wizards had selected Reed number two overall, right, and he was, like, going to get 30, 35 minutes a night and free reign to kind of just do whatever in Washington. Yeah, there'd still be a bunch of games where he looked incredible, but there'd also be a lot of games where he was the number one guy it, pretty much every night probably on the opposing team scouting report trying to shut him down. And it would have led to probably a, a bit more of a disjointed rookie season, a rookie season where he was probably, I don't want to say struggling, but just having a lot more attention directed his way and not able to just slot in and fill his role perfectly, which he should be able to do here in Houston. He and Fred Van Vliet are going to share nearly identical roles with the expectations placed on them inside of the Houston Rockets offense, being both you know primary initiators, but also being able to be utilized off ball, utilizing their scoring gravity, or sorry, their, I should say their shooting gravity um, from three-point land, like all these different things that they bring to the table. And that's going to be the biggest benefit for the Rockets is now you've got, I don't even want to call Reed a poor man's Fred Van Vliet because that feels like that feels like a knock on Reed. It's just having two guys that play such a similar style of basketball is going to be so beneficial because when Fred goes to sit on the bench, there's not going to be this massive drop off in play. Like we saw last season where the Rockets really didn't have anybody that could do what Fred Van Vliet could do. So when Fred was off the floor, the Rockets really struggled and that's that was one of the big issues last season. They just didn't have enough production to be able to win those non Fred Van Vliet minutes consistently. So hopefully Reed is able to address that for the Rockets this upcoming season. Now, the next question on this ESPN poll that we're going to get into is uh, which rookie has the best chance to win rookie of the year or, or who is your NBA rookie of the year pick? And Reed Shepard walked away with seven votes yet again in this category. We're going to unpack those votes and get into his chances to win rookie of the year for the Houston Rockets coming up here in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and so much more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices that you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. All right, let's get into this next poll category from the ESPN executive poll. Question being, who's your NBA Rookie of the Year pick? And Reed Shepard, again, 
cleaning up the votes in this category. Seven votes yet again for Reed Shepard. Now, I am curious. I wonder, this is just an outlier thought here. I do wonder if it's the exact same, since it's an anonymous poll, we're not going to know. But I do wonder if it's the same seven executives and scouts who voted for Reed Shepard in that first question about the best rookie and then also another, like the identical seven, or if the votes changed at all between the categories, if maybe he got some additional votes and then the other guys changed their vote. I, I am very curious because here's the issue for rookie. Well, you know, we'll get into the rookie of the year issues here in a second for Reed. Uh, let me just get through the rest of the votes here. So Reed Shepard gets seven of the available 20 votes. There was nobody abstaining from this set of votes. So all 20 votes were available in this category. Zach Eady comes in second with four votes for the Grizzlies. Stefan Castle got three votes for the Spurs. Donovan Klingen got two votes for the Blazers. And then the last four votes split across four different players. Zachary Riesache got one for the Hawks. Ron Holland got one for the Pistons. Dalton Connect got one for the Lakers. And Tristan De Silva got one for the Orlando Magic. That one was a, uh, a deep cut. Now, I will say, as a sidebar, I am a big fan of Tristan De Silva. We talked about him here uh, on LOR in the pre-draft process and our kind of pre-draft coverage with uh, co-host Madison Moore. And uh, Tristan Da Silva had a strong summer league. He looked good. Uh, I think, I don't know if he has a chance to win rookie of the year good, but that, that seems like a bit of a reach to me. All right. So the article goes on to say Shepard again, garnered the popular vote. He was likely uh, also a beneficiary of summer league bias kind of highlighted that earlier, but there's an increasing notion that the Rockets will have to find him the level of playing time necessary to contend for NBA Rookie of the Year. And I find that a very interesting notion because Reed is going, well, I do think he is going to benefit from being in this Houston Rock environment, being in a winning environment, learning from a point guard ahead of him in the rotation like Fred Van Vliet, uh, you know, learning under the tutelage of the Rockets coaching staff, Ime Udoka, all that stuff. All of that's going to be incredibly beneficial to read. But like I kind of already illustrated in segment one, he's not going to just be going to a bad team where he gets free reign to play 30, 35 plus minutes a night. That was that was where the Rockets were a few years ago when they drafted Jalen and Alpi and Jabari and Tari. And these rookies were able to just walk in with very little kind of expectations placed on them, uh, no demands, no expectation of winning, like, and, and they were able to just play, you know, a brunt of the minutes and just kind of work through their struggles as rookies. And because of that, right, there are going to be certain rookies in this draft class, and I'm going to kind of look up and down the draft board really quick. Uh, obviously, Alex Saar is going to have that kind of runway with the Rosh with the Washington Wizards. Uh, Zachary Riesche, I, I will. I'm assuming that he gets injected into the Hawks starting lineup. I can't imagine that they wouldn't start him right out of the gate. Um, Reed Shepard is not going to be starting. Stefan Castle, I find, is an interesting one, especially with the pickup of Chris Paul. Not sure what his minutes totals are going to ultimately look like for the Spurs. Ron Holland, another interesting one. Uh, I, I I don't know if I can confidently say that he's going to be in the Pistons starting lineup. Donovan Klingon, what do you do? Because you've already got uh, DeAndre Ayton. Are they going to run the Twin Towers big lineup uh, in, in Portland? Uh, Rob Dillingham for the Minnesota Timberwolves. He's clearly coming off the bench. He's going, it's, it's actually funny that the two, Kentucky guards in the draft basically went to identical situations where they went to teams that are going to be playing high level competitive basketball and they're both going to be playing very key reserve roles off the bench, uh, which will ultimately, and this is the downside, it's ultimately going to limit their overall production because if Reed and, and to a lesser extent, right, Dillingham, if these guys are only getting 15 to 20 20 minutes a night, something like that, then it's going to be a lot harder for them just from a sheer uh, counting stats perspective to compete with another rookie like potentially an Alex Saar type who is getting 30, 35 plus minutes a night and, and just unlimited runway to rack up all the counting stats available. I do think that when they look at rookie of the year, I, I do believe that it's tough to say that they factor in winning to an extent, but I do think you have to contextualize and say, okay, well, if Alex Saar plays 35 minutes a night and averages, I don't know, we'll say 16, 
seven and like two blocks a game. What something like that. But if Reed Shepard only plays 15 to 20 minutes a night and he's averaging, I don't know, 12, five and two, like, I don't know, like, you know, 12 points, five assists. I don't know why I did assists and rebounds flipped there, but how do you evaluate right when you look at, okay, well, Reed clearly was producing more in the minutes that he was given. He just wasn't given enough minutes. And that's ultimately the debate here is where are the Rockets going to find minutes for Reed Shepard and who of the other rookies in the draft class are actually going to be given enough runway to win rookie of the year. Zach Eady is the other interesting one. I- I'm very curious to see what the Memphis Grizzlies ultimately do with him. I think, don't think he's going to be in their starting lineup on opening night, but I also could be wrong on that. I don't know. That's, that's a really weird one there. I, I don't, I, I'll, you know, I'll say it right now. I don't think Zachy is going to be in the starting lineup for the Grizzlies come opening night, but I do think he's going to play a really big role for the Grizzlies, which is why right now, when you take a look at the outright betting favorites, for NBA Rookie of the Year, it's still Zach Eady number one at plus 600, Reed Shepard behind him at plus 700, then you got Zachary Risache, Alex Saar, Matis Buzelis is another big one for the Chicago Bull- Bulls, he'll get plenty of runway, and I, I think I think Buzelis is probably my sleeper pick to win Rookie of the Year, because I do think he has, of, of all of like the lottery picks at the top of this year's NBA draft, I think he's going to have the most... I think he's going to probably have the best chance to win it. And I will say Bub Carrington's the other one to keep an eye on because both of those guys are going to have plenty of minutes, plenty of opportunities to rack up the stats to make a strong case for rookie of the year. Again, I do think that Reed Shepard, Rob Dillingham are both going to probably be the more impactful picks for their respective teams. Uh, but when you start looking at the Rockets lens of things, just to kind of get, get back on track here, get back to the Rockets scope, how... How should the Rockets try and juggle the rotations this next season? I will say that this past year, one of the issues that they faced is they were running Fred Van Vliet ragged last season. I mean, they were he was a top five minutes per game guy in the NBA for most of the season. I don't know where he actually, I, I should have probably pulled this up. I don't know where he finished the season as far as raw minutes per game totals, but Fred is not the kind of guy, especially as an undersized point guard, who's so critical to the Rockets' success. He's not the kind of guy that you want to run into the ground ahead of what you hope is, uh, you know, a strong postseason run. I'm not saying that the Rockets are going to go to the Western Conference Finals or the Finals or anything, but you want to make it to the postseason, right? And you don't want Fred VanVleet to be completely broken down by the time that April and May basketball roll around. So I do think that this is, one of the benefits of getting Reed Shepard is you should theoretically be able to wean off of the Fred Van Vliet minutes without that much of a drop off from what he provides. Because again, the skill sets are so similar. I could see a world where the Rockets kind of reduce Fred's minutes on a given kind of nightly basis, somewhere around that 30 to 32 range to make sure that Reed Shepard is getting, you know, that, 16 to 18 minutes a night as the de facto backup point guard, getting you know a steady dosage of primary ball handling responsibilities, but also still being utilized off ball. I'm sure there are going to be plenty of lineups that feature Reed Shepard and Jalen Green, where Reed is being able to play is able to play on ball or playing off ball to Jalen Green as the primary initiator, or backcourt lineups that feature. Reed Shepard and Cam Whitmore, where Reed is then the on-ball presence because we know that, you know, playing on-ball and creating for his teammates is not exactly one of Cam's strengths yet as a player. Uh, Honestly, we might even see some Reed Shepard, Fred Van Vliet minutes, similar to how last season we saw uh, Fred Van Vliet and Aaron Holiday minutes. So the possibilities are kind of endless for the Rockets. I do think that they are going to, I, I fully agree with the sentiment from, Givoni and Wu, the Rockets are going to have to find a way to get Reed Shepard more minutes next season. I think he's going to have a very similar impact to kind of like almost like Atari Eason level of impact where you're you're sitting there scratching your head thinking, damn, how do we get this guy more minutes? Because he's so good in the minutes where he's on the floor. 
I, and you know, I could see a world where by the end, by seasons in, maybe he starts the season getting around, you know, something kind of conservative, like 15 or so minutes a night. I could see by seasons in where he's up to 20 ish something minutes a night. Uh, I don't think he's ever going to at any point, like supersede anybody in the rotation. I don't think he's going to replace Fred or Jalen or anybody in the starting lineup or anything to that, to that effect. But I do see a world where his usage, where his role uh, increases considerably as the season moves on, as he kind of knocks off that rookie rust and gets acclimated to the NBA speed, pace of play, all those different factors. But as it stands right now, I, I, I do think he is going to suffer from being in that reduced role, and it's going to be tough for him to win Rookie of the Year, uh, but I won't rule him out yet. And at, again, once we, once we get to the NBA season and once we see what some of these other rookies and their roles look like with their respective teams, we'll get a better idea of whether or not Reed has a legit shot to win Rookie of the, Re- Rookie of the Year, even in a reserve, a reserve role coming off the Rockets bench backing up Fred Van Vliet. And, and also, I just want to point out here, it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Fred did miss a little bit of time last season. It's not complete. Now, well, while we're obviously hoping for 100% health across the board, the reality is guys are going to miss time. You're going to have injuries. You're going to have games where Fred's probably going to miss a game or two. We saw it happen with Amin Thompson last season where he was injected into the Rockets starting lineup after the Alper and Shingun injury. Now, look, knock on wood. Hopefully nobody gets injured for the Rockets, but there might be some games where Reed Shepard does step into the starting lineup. Maybe resting Fred Van Vliet on back-to-backs, that kind of thing. Like maybe that's something. If Reed is playing so well that you feel like there's not that much of a drop-off between Fred and and Reed, then maybe they do decide to kind of put Fred in some bubble wrap and rest him up and make sure that he's as fresh as possible and leaning a little bit more heavily on Reed Shepard. Uh, you know, kind of in the back half of the season once he's uh, settled in to his rookie campaign. But I want your thoughts on Reed Shepard's chances to win Rookie of the Year. Let me know in the YouTube comments how you're feeling about that whole situation, how you feel about the executive polls by uh, ESPN from uh, Jonathan Givoni and Jeremy Wu. Let me know all your thoughts in the comment section. Coming up, going to share some Rockets Olympic th- Rockets Olympics thought. That's a tongue twister a little bit with the double S Rockets Olympics thoughts on Dylan Brooks, Jock Landale, Jack McVeigh, and uh, assistant coach Royale Ivy, as well as maybe some from team USA. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Look, I love sports. I love them so much. I never really want them to stop. And thankfully, we got the Olympics. We got Olympics basketball to kind of carry us through. But, you know, once the Olympics start winding down and you're getting, you know, the games are gone again and the sports really aren't sportsing the way you maybe want them to. Look, FanDuel lets you keep the sports going whenever you want. All you have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime that you're in the mood. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That means there's something for everyone every day all summer long. We just talked about it a moment ago. But the odds to win Rookie of the Year here this next season, Zach Eady still the favorite right now at plus 600. Reed Shepard, though, right behind him at plus 700. So go get in on that action. Just head on over to FanDuel.com for those odds and so much more to start making the most out of your summer FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. All right, let's do a quick Rockets Olympics (laughs) check-in. No tongue-tied there at the start of this segment. Uh, Dylan Brooks, Jock Landale, Jack McVay, a couple Aussies, a couple Boomers there, and then assistant coach Royal Ivy coaching for South Sudan. Uh, We'll start with uh, Dylan the villain playing for Team Canada because... We already know, or we already knew, I should say, past tense. Uh, Last summer, Dylan Brooks, freshly signed Dylan Brooks, right? We got to see Dylan Brooks compete in World Cup action for Team Canada last offseason. And it was a ton of fun because the Rockets were, obviously, he was one of the big marquee free agency signings for the Rockets. And it was kind of a first glimpse at like, hey, who's this new guy for a lot of Rockets fans that hadn't really gotten the chance to watch Dylan Brooks play consistently And there were high hopes set for Dylan Brooks that he could kind of break some of the poor tendencies uh, that he had when he was with the Memphis Grizzlies. And I do think that he had a phenomenal FIBA World Cup tournament. Uh, They were able to, he was named uh, best defensive player at the tournament. And ultimately, 
the play, the way he played at the tournament, I think did translate to the Rockets for at least about two thirds of the season. I do think for kind of like the last one third or so, there were some, some games, some stretches where we saw Dylan Brooks kind of fall back into some of those old tendencies, some of the things that probably drove Memphis Grizzlies fans a little, a little sideways, a little upset, you know, just about how he played the, you know, the, the, the poor shot selection. Um, there were some moments near the end of the season where, and I, I don't know if this was like, him being gassed or being worn down or what, but you know, there was some defensive slippage at the end of the year as well, but he's kind of back to form now playing for team Canada in the Paris Olympics. Uh, they are currently two and O in their, in their division, in their, in their group, I should say. Uh, and, and Brooks is clearly one of the reasons why, uh, he's averaging 15 points, four rebounds in just under 25 minutes of contest right now, shooting 50% from the floor and a blistering, 70% from behind the three-point line. Uh, Currently, his plus-minus average is 17.5, plus 17.5. Clearly, his play is translating to winning basketball minutes for Team Canada. Uh, And I think when you start, when you look across the board at all the teams, you know, competing in the Paris Olympics, Team USA by far the favorite to win the gold medal. Uh, they should be. They are the most like head and heels above all the other competition from a sheer talent perspective. It's just it's basically unfair. But if you were to ask me which team or teams have the best chance at upsetting Team USA, my short list would be Team Canada, uh, Germany and France. I think those three teams are the best or have the best chance to ultimately upset Team USA just from a uh, sheer talent perspective, um, but also just the way that they play together, like watching some of these teams play. I do think that some of the national teams that have, I guess, more more national team like chemistry they've played together before uh they've practiced together rather than you know team usa which obviously far and away has the most talent but these guys don't play together nearly as consistently as say team germany or team france like these guys spend a lot more time with one another and know each other and know their tendencies and that chemistry cannot be understated. And you do see that at times teams in the Olympics who can put on a really strong showing just because of really good coaching and, and just good chemistry across the board. Uh, shout out to Houston Rockets assistant coach Royal Ivy coaching uh, for South Sudan, who really pushed Team USA to the brink almost uh, in the friendly matchup before the uh, the group play started. Uh, they kind of got waxed by Team USA the other day, but uh, South Sudan doesn't have, they've got a couple NBA players, Winnie and Gabriel and, and JT Thor coming off the bench, but they don't have like any top tier NBA talent on their roster. And yet they're still playing some really impressive basketball. So unfortunately I don't think South Sudan is going to make it out of group C for, uh, to, to make it into the knockout stage. I, they, they have a chance because you look at Group C in the Olympics. U.S. is currently 2-0. and Serbia 1-1. One and one, South Sudan 1-1. One and one, Puerto Rico's 0-2. of two. South Sudan still has a chance. And, and I'm not... Of the game, of the teams that I highlighted there a moment ago that have a chance to knock off the United States, I just don't think Serbia has the firepower. Like, outside of Jokic and, and Bogdanovic, they just don't have a lot going on for them. And very similar to the Nuggets all the time, uh, they actually... Played, they actually won the Jokic minutes when he was on the floor in USA versus Serbia. But then Jokic went to the bench, and I think the I think the Serbian team was like minus twenty six or something in the non Jokic minutes, which is just absolutely brutal. So it's more or less the the same symptom that the Nuggets deal with when Jokic goes to the bench. So I, I don't think Serbia is gonna have a chance to ultimately beat the U.S. on the way to uh, a gold medal. But back to uh, Back to Dylan Brooks, back to Team Canada. Uh, it's, I mean, you look from up and down their roster, talent-wise, I think they've got probably, arguably, the second most talented team in the Olympics. Just, you look at, I mean, obviously Dylan Brooks, SGA, Lou Dort, uh, Jamal Murray coming off the bench, Andrew Nimhard, Kelly Olenek. They've got a lot of NBA-level talent and a lot of really strong talent up and down that roster. So I think that's probably my favorite team to possibly upset Team USA, uh, but elsewhere for the Houston Rockets. So not only is, is Dylan Brooks playing well um, and, you know, hopefully carrying 
Team Canada to you know a strong. I won't say gold medal finish because you USA trumps all right now. USA is going to win gold. That's where my 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 national pride steps in here for a moment. But hopefully he, he continues to have a really strong uh, Olympics for Team Canada. And then the Rockets do have a pair of Aussies on the roster. Newly signed Jack McVeigh and of course Jock Landale um, playing for. Team Australia. Uh, now, Team Australia did just recently lose to Team Canada. It was actually cool. We saw uh, Dylan Brooks uh, kind of taunting Jock Landale after hitting a three in his face, and he gave him a little hug afterwards. And I'm sure it's got to be a ton of fun for NBA teammates or you know whatnot to to go to be able to play head to head against each other in in an environment like the Olympics. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of you know trash talking going on back and forth, all that good stuff. Uh, but for the Boomers, uh, Jock Landale's had a really strong Olympic showing so far against Team Canada. He had 16 points, 12 rebounds, and 4 assists on 7 of 10 shooting. And then off the bench, Jack McVeigh, uh, 15 minutes off the bench for the Boomers. He had 9 points, a couple rebounds, uh, shot 3 of 5 from 3-point land. Uh, quick aside on Jack McVeigh before getting back to Jock Landale, uh, and then we'll kind of wrap things up for the show. But I think with... With Jack McVeigh, there is a distinct possibility. Like, I, I could see a world where because he's coming in as an older player, 20, what, 27, 28 years old, um, you know, he's played a lot of professional basketball in his career already. He's not coming in as a rookie, right? He's not some guy on a two-way deal, like a fringe NBA talent, like a like a Nate Hinton type. He's an older, more established kind of player. I would look at Jack McVeigh in a similar light to... Uh, Kind of Jay Sean Tate, like when Jay Sean Tate came to the NBA, he wasn't a traditional rookie, right? He was an older rookie. I mean, we had people cracking jokes about like Jay Sean Tate collecting Social Security during his rookie season. But I would look at him in that light where I think he's going to be able to come in and situationally, he might be able to be a contributor for this Rockets team. The shooting is very real. And if he can at least defend at a, at a decent enough level, then I wouldn't be surprised to see Ime Udoka toy with some lineups where he features Jack McVay just for his sheer shooting prowess. So... I think that's something to be on the lookout for this upcoming season. And when it comes to back to Jock Landale, first off, the Rockets are so incredibly deep at the center position between Alper and Shingun starting, uh, what is hopefully, knock on wood, a healthy Steven Adams coming back from his rehab, uh, backing up Shingun, giving them a much different look at the five spot, and then also still Jock Landale in the mix. That's got to be probably uh, across the entire NBA landscape. That's got to be the best, deepest center rotation in the league. Now, unfortunately, no team really needs three centers deep, especially when they all, I'm not going to say they all have similar skills. Like, you know, Steven Adams is the big, massive, you know, I, I won't call him like the drop big or whatever. He's just the big rebounding machine. Uh, Shingun's the offensive phenom. Jock Landale doesn't really provide like a, a, a different skill set from either of those two guys. He's not He's not going to be a better screener than Steven Adams. He's not going to be a better rebounder than Steven Adams. He probably not, he's not going to be a better defender than Steven Adams. So I, it kind of sucks that Jock Landale is going to get the short end of the stick here. But I do think that Jock Landale's play here in, in the Olympics – could potentially right he's he kind of rehabilitated his image a little bit at the end of last season stepping in for Alper and Shingun to to wrap up the season after Shingun's injury and with his strong play here in the Olympics I do hope that there's a world where the Rockets are able to potentially dangle Jock Landale as a really enticing trade piece in discussions around the league because you start looking at what the Rockets could potentially do some of the you know trades or maneuvers that they can make and you've got Jock Landale, who's on uh, effectively a, a one-year expiring deal every season for the next three years at just $8 million, very team-friendly deal. Uh, any team would, I mean, he is in a pinch. I wouldn't, I, I'm not going to go outright and say he's a starting caliber big man. I think he can be for the right team, but he would be an incredible get as a backup big for almost any team in the association. So I do think that the Rockets have a chance here based on Jock's play to end the season and hopefully his continued strong play through the Olympics to be able to entertain some offers and, you know, maybe field some phone calls about, or at least, you know, start picking up the phone and making calls themselves, I should say, to try and deal him ahead of the NBA trade deadline and recoup 
some value. Could be, you know, future first round pick. Could be to package Jock Landale with a couple other guys on the roster. I mean, you look up and down, the Rockets have some expendable salary on the roster with Jay Sean Tate, with Jeff Green. Although I do, I do still kind of expect Jeff Green to kind of be in the mix a little bit this upcoming season as a as a key rotation piece. Situationally, uh, he probably won't. Uh, be featured nearly as much as he was this past season, kind of by necessity because Jock Langell just wasn't up to snuff for most of the season. But that is going to be an interesting thing to keep an eye on because unfortunately, it's not like the Rockets are going to have a ton of a ton of minutes to give both Jock Landale and Steven Adams right out of the gate. And, and I think fairly so, Steven Adams is going to be right behind Shingun in the depth chart, unless for whatever reason, Jock Landale just completely outplays him at training camp, which I don't think is going to happen. Uh, it's going to be tough for the Rockets to kind of find minutes for Jock Landale to, I guess, you know, quote unquote, showcase him before the NBA trade deadline. So this kind of Paris Olympics run it is kind of the Jock Landale showcase a little bit showing, hey, like he is a high quality NBA caliber center and the Rockets are going to probably be able to point to his play in the Olympics to say, hey, like you guys want to trade for Jock Landale? Like this is what you're getting. This is the guy he can he can produce when given the opportunity. I'm, I'm happy for Jock. He looks healthy. He looks like he's got his bounce back. And that was a big thing for him last year, right? His first major injury in his career with the ankle. Uh, it really, really sidetracked him for so much of the season. I really don't think he was back to being 100% himself until like January or February or so. And then at that point, even when he did start getting minutes, it kind of felt like he had the yips a little bit where like he hadn't played consistently for so long that like he was having mistakes, like some of the whiffed layups and, you know, missed box outs and li little things like that that aren't, you know, characteristically like problems for him. And, you know, thankfully he worked himself back into form uh, just in time to step in for Alper and Shingun. And now he's having a really strong, uh, you know, Olympics performance for uh, for the Boomers for Team Australia. So I, I couldn't be happier for Jock Landale. Although, again, I, I don't think he is long for the Houston Rockets. I think that he is one of the few trade chips that the Rockets have to make an improvement on the roster at some point this next season. So we'll ultimately see what direction the Rockets go there. Uh I already highlighted Royal Ivy earlier talking about South Sudan, but I, again, just very impressed with the coaching job that he's doing there, uh, you know, and, and league wide. I mean, a lot of NBA pundits talking heads are talking about what Royal Ivy's doing with South Sudan. And I think it, it, you know, he deserves a lot of recognition. And unfortunately for the Rockets, the Rockets now have two assistant coaches that are likely going to be primed to take on head coaching positions elsewhere. And that's that's the reality of the situation when you come from the Greg Popovich coaching tree and you've got Ime Odoka, one of the descendants there, and then he's going to have more descendants of the Pop coaching tree with Royal Ivy and Ben Sullivan. Both of those guys are probably going to be fielding offers uh, to become head coaches uh, maybe as early as next summer, 2025. So the Rockets could potentially lose one of, if not both, Ivy or Sullivan. Um next summer to a team looking to take a chance on a first time NBA head coach. But you know, that's, that's a problem for next summer. It's just something to keep an eye on. Last thing that I wanted to chime in here, non-basketball related, but did you guys see the Turkish dude who brought home silver in the shooting competition with no gear whatsoever? Like that guy was absolutely a hitman, like earlier in his career, and like dude, dude just rolled up very casual, no eye protection, no goggles, no 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 ear protection, nothing. Just rolled up in there and and got silver. Uh, and uh, there have been a ton of jokes uh, about him. I I I've made the crack that I need Alper and Shingun to come into the season shooting like this. Um, obviously the Turkish connection there. And then last thing, um. Somebody did Photoshop a picture of Al P over his head, and that's absolutely going to make the rounds this next season. Like every time Alper and Shingun hits a three pointer, I'm sure we're going to see that photo, that that photo, that photo floating around. Uh, so it'll be a ton of fun. But with that, uh, I didn't get a chance to talk too much about Team USA. Probably going to revisit that in a future episode as we're navigating the rest of the Paris Paris Olympics. But that's going to do it for today's episode. 
As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, leave us a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Thank you.